So let's dig in to the content. Take just a second to read through that session description that's on your screen and get ready to learn. So we know that behavior error is exhibited in a range of intensity, right? In this session, we're gonna focus on those lower level but challenging behaviors that occur in classrooms and schools around the state almost on a daily basis. Those behaviors that get in the way of instructional engagement in your classrooms. This session is a really good one that lays the groundwork for responding to behavior within that continuum of support. As Karen said, um, be prepared to do some self-reflection in that journal and also some group processing. Now to kick it off, let's think about and respond to these two prompts. First one, prompt A, how does staff at your school respond to academic error? And the second one, how does staff at your school respond to behavioral error? Take a moment to think. So the letter A, I'm seeing a lot around reteaching, retakes, nurturing, feedback, um, meeting the needs of students, planned intervention and in teaching, smaller group size, modeling, seeking, suppo uh, seeking support if growth is not recurrent, re uh, occurring, teaching, um, and then what are you seeing around the B responses? Yeah, absolutely. So then around the B responses, um, we're seeing more around um, is somebody else's problem to fix, negative, even judge, judgmental at times. There might be a, another place or space, so a student, a student success team to meet those needs, or uh, could be accusatory. Um, I'm seeing terms like punishments, um, responses are inconsistent, sometimes frustration. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of, and there was a lot. Let me tell you, Rachel, there are a lot of responses here. So everybody did all it. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing those responses. Um, what, what Karen is reading, um, has been my experience as well. Um, I've been a special ed teacher for a really long time, working with students uh, with both emotional behavioral disorders and cross-categorically. Um, so I'm right on board with you. Let's take a look at what research tells us some common responses to error are. And you can do a little comparing and contrasting to some of the things that you wrote or heard about. First, let's examine some frequent responses to academic error. When a teacher notices an academic error, more often than not, that error is considered to be either something done by accident or it's caused by a skill deficit. In response, teachers most often provide more practice and additional feedback. And then if that error continues to occur, teachers really carefully diagnose the problem, they adjust their teaching, they provide additional assistance and feedback until the student demonstrates that they've correctly learned the skill a lot of those things that I heard mentioned. Now, let's take a look at common responses to behavioral error. According to the research, it is pretty typical that behavioral error triggers an emotional response from adults. Teachers often assume that the error is deliberate or that it's caused by a performance deficit it is current, they respond by issuing a consequence or a punishment. And then if the error continues, the student is often labeled insubordinate. They're thought to be exhibiting this behavior, even though they know it is right, they've been told to stop and they're choosing to do bad things anyway. The student is, addish, is issued additional consequences up to and including removal. Removal from their small group, removal from recess, removal from lunch, removal from the classroom, or even removal from the school. And that removal often is maintained until it's felt that the student has learned his or her lesson. So let's think about what we can learn from this. In the world of academics, a new skill is taught. It's learned and practiced with accuracy 
Intel students are fluent. They're provided opportunities for ongoing practice, which leads to generalization until students demonstrate their ability to apply that skill to more than the original situation. Now let's walk through a scenario that demonstrates where things break down when we think about behavioral errors. Let's say it's the first day of school, sixth grade. It's Karen's first class, language arts, and she has taught about a fantastic new organizational school tool, the planner. I'm guessing you've heard of those, right? She is taught that each day homework will be written on the board and students have the responsibility for writing those assignments in their planner before they're dismissed. The teacher also mentions that it would be a really good idea to mark the current date with a paperclip so that over time students can get immediately to the right date. All right, so time moves forward, the second day, the third day, fourth, the entire first week, the teacher prompts and gives practice to students using their planner sometime before the end of class. However, she does not mention the paperclip trip. So at the end of class, when Karen needs to get her assignment written down, sometimes she just opens to a random page and fills it in. You can probably guess what happens, right? There's a breakdown. Karen gets frustrated in the evening. Sometimes she gives up, she doesn't find the correct page, and she doesn't do her homework. This in turn triggers a response from her parents and from her language arts teacher about missing work. Karen was not prompted to practice the full skill each day, which in turn led to some additional behaviors. Now let's take this a little further. Karen's first class in the afternoon is science. The science teacher assumes that using the planner was fully taught in Karen's first period class. He notes he taught it in his first period class. So he just very, very briefly mentions that the assignment is written on the board and that students should write in their planner as soon as they enter class. Now, because all of Karen's main instruction and practice has been in her language arts class with a different process, she continues to use that planner at the end of class. Hmm. What do you think's gonna happen, right? Karen gets called out for using her assignment notebook at the wrong time and responds with anger. She hasn't practiced this skill to the degree that she can easily transfer it to other slightly different situations. Now the staff absolutely had the right idea to teach the behavior they wanted to see. And if all the staff had been on the same page and utilized this skill development model that they use in the instruction of academics, Karen's behaviors would have been minimized. And the response to those behaviors, reteaching, practice, would have yielded a lasting impact rather than further behaviors. Unfortunately, what we have found with behavior is that most often we introduce a new skill, we teach it once, and then we leap directly to the expectation that students transfer that skill to a new and different situation almost immediately. And it just doesn't work. Well, My hi, this keeps is Angie. Jumping. Oh, there she is. Okay. Yep, I'm here. Yep. Um, in my group, um, we talked about how um, with our academic interventions, we or academic um, needs, we're constantly checking for understanding and we're really looking at what the root of the problem is, where is this, the deficit. And um, so if we be, be, model our behavior responses in that same way, um, then we're able to come in more um, with a compassionate view um, and looking at the bigger picture of what's going on and not um, bringing in so much emotion with it then, um, since we too de do tend to get a little riled up and heightened when there's um, behavior errors in our classrooms. Okay. Um, so we were on a, a variety of um, age levels and grade levels, so it was interesting to have our conversation, but we came to a few things that stuck out to all of us and resonated, and one of them was to remove assumptions that something has already been taught. Um, that was especially something that the older grades had recognized that they do more frequently and um, and the younger grades were able to acknowledge that we probably don't do our share of reteaching of that either. Um, which then led into the willingness to reteach those skills once you realize there's a deficit there. 
And then on, um, one of the ladies had suggested um, something that had come from another uh, session, and that was the three R's, the regulate, relate, and reason. And so that was also something that continued to um, resonate with us as we're working through some of the processes that we see with the behaviors of kids. This is Madeline. Go ahead. Um, yeah, our group talked about a lot um, of the early childhood. We were kindergarten, first grade, and special ed. Um, so we talked about modeling, 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 modeling expected behaviors. Um, in the kindergarten class, I do a lot of nonverbal cues that I teach to my students at the beginning of the year to um, show them that I see them and I hear them, but I cannot talk to them at that moment. So um, a lot of wait or stop, sit down. Um, we talked about praising students who are modeling the desired behavior. We talked about acknowledging desired behaviors and then explaining the outcome. For example, I love that you're raising your hand. Now I can hear what you have to say. Um, and then also talked about using those students who might be struggling with behaviors to be the model. Because sometimes it's the attention that they want more than anything. So if they're the, you know, on the stage modeling the behavior, they might get what they need from that. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. That's wonderful. Wow, we have some really smart people here, Rachel. Back to you. With a second outcome uh, around responding to behavior in the moment. And then we'll move into the next outcome around giving, um, refining your systems and practices to prevent the behavior from occurring. So there are multiple ways that educators can respond to behavioral error in the moment. First one we're going to talk about is punishment. And this has been mentioned multiple times um, throughout the session. We want to start by sharing with you the Webster definition of punishment. So here it is, according to Webster, the act of punishing, suffering, pain, or loss that serves as retribution. A penalty inflicted on an offender through a judicial process. And finally, severe, rough, or disastrous treatment. Now in the world of psychology, punishment is defined a little differently. So here's that definition. Punishment in the world of psychology is defined as a consequence that follows an operant response. In this case, the operant response we're talking about is behavioral error. So it's defined as an operant response that decreases or attempts to decrease the likelihood of that response or behavioral error occurring in the future. We know that punishment is often part of a district discipline policy especially for significant behaviors, those behaviors that cause harm to others or self or property. We also know that punishment is frequently used at the, at the classroom level. And those responses can range all the way from the look to removal from the classroom. Now, before we talk further about punishment, let's look at some national research about punishment. This research was done in 2012 by Russ Skiba. His research shared a couple of things, and it's, it's in something called race is not neutral. So his research found, first of all, that students of color, specifically black boys, got referred, got those office discipline referrals for subjective behaviors. Subjective behaviors are those that are based on interpretation. And often they're classroom level behaviors like defiance and disrespect. White students got referrals for very objective behaviors, behaviors that are concrete, that we can clearly see, and that are more often to be included, or more likely to be included in policy. Things like fighting. You're either fighting or you're not fighting. You're either doing drugs or you're not doing drugs. Furthermore, the research also showed that black boys got more severe punishment for minor behavioral errors, like an, an out of school suspension for repeated disruption, versus white kids who got less severe punishment for more severe behaviors. Something like fighting would yield an in school suspension. So as we keep equity at the center of all that we do, all that we say, all that we ask you to think about, it's important to keep this in mind as we dig in a little more into 
uh, what additional research tells us about punishment. So punishment teaches students what not to do, but it absolutely does not teach what we want students to do, that desired behavior. We also know that punishment fails to address all of those factors that contribute to the behavior. The root cause that was mentioned um, as one of your groups was talking about uh, comparing the response to academics to the response to behavior. We also know that punishment is likely to have really undesirable side effects like anger, retaliation, dislike toward the teacher or the school, and social withdrawal. In fact, it actually teaches other students to aggress toward or punish their peers. Now, punishment can also be really reinforcing. Sometimes our punishment allows students to avoid or escape situations that they find aversive. This is called negative reinforcement. And the reality is any reduction in behavior that occurs following a punishment is more often than not very short term. In the broad picture, punishment creates a negative classroom and school climate. But again, we know that punishment impacts any individual who's on the receiving end of it, but we can't lose sight of the research that tells us who is most often on that receiving end and the, the severity of that punishment response based on subgroups in our population. So what is a more effective way of responding to behavioral error? One is to teach students that replacement behavior, the behavior that we want to see. So instruction should focus on teaching that behavior and follow the skill development model that we mentioned earlier. It's important that that instruction not only include the procedures and routines of the classroom and common areas, but also those social emotional learning competencies, the college and career readiness skills. And think about what that means in this unusual time of starting the school year, perhaps a little differently this year. We need to define what those skills are that students need and then follow this replacement, this teaching model to make sure that they have those skills to fluency. Here's a little bit more research. In, in 20, 2009, someone by the name of Philippa Lally found that on average, it takes more than two months before a new behavior becomes automatic. Think of that, 66 days to be exact. So if you count out our school year, if you teach a new skill, like some of you will be teaching how to do school in uh, this new kind of way, whether that's hybrid or whatever it is, we can't expect students to have mastered that to fluency and generalizing, adapting until right before winter break. That's huge. Another effective strategy to use when responding to behavioral error is corrective feedback. We wanna make sure that when you think about corrective feedback, you think of it as something that is consistent or predictable, it's very specific. It's really that brief instruction in the moment around what the behavioral error was followed by brief instruction that redirects the student's focus. Now, when using corrective feedback, it's really important that the response is focused on the skill and not a judgment of the person. Feedback should be given in the least restrictive environment, in a private, quiet, and respectful ma manner. You need to make sure after you give this corrective feedback, you move away. Give the student a little time to think and then check back in after giving that adequate response time. Another effective way to respond is by using diffusing statements. It's a really good idea to have some of these at the ready for you yourself and also in any plans, lesson plans that you have for anyone that might be taking your place as a guest teacher. So here's just a couple examples. Wow, sounds like you're mad. I get it, I feel that way sometimes too. I bet you have a good reason. I know there's a solution to this. I don't know what it is right now, but I bet if we can meet a little bit later, we can figure it out together. Another one, looks like you don't wanna do this right now. 
I get it. Sometimes I feel that way too, but I really appreciate you sticking with it. So diffusing statements like these validate and affirm the student's point of view and emotion, as well as the needs of the teacher. It defers a really important conversation to a time when both the teacher and the student are calm. Now you can find more information on this strategy and lots of others by clicking on the link at the bottom of this slide, which will take you to modules on our website called Culturally Responsive Classroom Management. These modules are created by the Wisconsin RTI Center and are invaluable as you think about planning for the start of your school year. Now, before we transition to environmental and instructional factors, we'd like you to take two minutes to think about and identify how these strategies might fit into your daily routine. So we, we were at various different levels and different scope of practice. Uh, me being a social worker, that teaching replacement stuff, we talked about how it kind of loses some of its luster. If they come to me and I reteach re it, it really centers itself in the moment in the classroom and we unpacked it a little bit further to say um, a lot of it boils down to regulation not only for the student but the teacher or the person that's in the moment with it with with them and then empathy whatever that student or family has kind of gone through um, and then just making sure that we're empathizing and not taking for granted that they may not even know what the skill is or why they're why they're mad in a in a grade school level or something like that, but just just taking it back to square one and not taking anything for granted. Thank you, Jonathan. So we know that creating a positive learning environment includes both of those, right? Environmental and instructional factors. And there are way more of those factors than we can mention on one slide or even in one conference session. So we're gonna take just a second to focus on four high leverage factors. The first factor we'll talk about is how expectations and rules should be based on a legitimate purpose in your setting. Not just because we've always had that rule, it's part of our tradition, or maintaining that status quo. There needs to be a contextual fit for students and families. We need to understand the population of students that we serve so that we can identify how to connect and bridge culture to school expectations. Additionally, all expectations and rules should be identified paying really close attention to the developmental level of your students, as well as classroom specific context. Next, we'll talk a little bit about the importance of culture of your building. When your students and your staff feel a sense of belonging, acceptance and inclusion, interactions between them are far more likely to be positive and respectful. You'll have a lower incident of behavior referral and an increased positive resolution of any behavioral errors that do occur. The third is a fit of academic demands. Now we want to be really clear. This is not about lowering our expectations for students, but rather it's about making sure that we as teachers are providing the supports and scaffolding that are so necessary for mastery of complex material. And finally, let's think about the importance of engaging instruction and high rates of opportunity to respond. All instruction needs to be rigorous and relevant and provide students the opportunities to both interact with the material and each other, as well as the instructor, to demonstrate mastery. When these things are done really well, with fidelity, 80 to 90% of students should respond positively to the proactive and environmental factors. Thank you for participating in this session. 